Psalm 55 of The Treasury of David. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Treasury of David, Volume 3, by Charles Spurgeon. Psalm 55. Title To the Chief Musician on Neganoth. Another song to be accompanied by stringed instruments. The strain is at one time mournful and at another softly sweet. It needed the chief musician's best care to see that the music was expressive of the sentiment. Maskell. It is not a mere personal hymn. There is teaching in it for us all, and where our Lord shines through David, his personal type, there is a great deep of meaning. Of David. The man of many conditions, much tried and much favored, persecuted but delivered and exalted was from experience enabled to write such precious verses, in which he sets forth not only the sorrows of common pilgrims, but of the Lord of the way himself. Subject. It would be idle to fix a time and find an occasion for this psalm with any dogmatism. It reads like a song of the time of Absalom and Ahithophel. It was after David had enjoyed peaceful worship, verse 14, when he was or had just been a dweller in a city, verses 9, 10, and 11, and when he remembered his former roamings in the wilderness. Altogether, it seems to us to relate to that mournful era when the king was betrayed by his trusted counselor. The spiritual eye ever and anon sees the son of David and Judas and the chief priests appearing and disappearing upon the glowing canvas of the psalm. Divisions. From verses 1 to 8, the suppliant spreads his case in general before his God. In verses 9, 10, and 11, he portrays his enemies. In verses 12 to 14, he mentions one special traitor and cries for vengeance, or foretells it in verse 15. From verses 16 to 19, he consoles himself by prayer and faith. In verses 20 and 21, he again mentions the deceitful covenant breaker and closes with a cheering exhortation to the saints, verse 22, and a denunciation of destruction upon the wicked and deceitful, verse 23. Exposition. Verses 1 to 8. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from my supplication. Attend unto me and hear me. I mourn in my complaint and make a noise. Because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they cast iniquity upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is sore pained within me, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror hath overwhelmed me. And I said, O oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. Lo, then would I wander far off and remain in a wilderness. Selah. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. Verse 1. Give ear to my prayer, O God. The fact is so commonly before us, otherwise we should be surprised to observe how universally and constantly the saints resort to prayer in seasons of distress. From the great elder brother down to the very least of the divine family, all of them delight in prayer. They run as naturally to the mercy seat in time of trouble as the little chickens to the hen in the hour of danger. But note well that it is never the bare act of prayer which satisfies the godly. They crave an audience with heaven and an answer from the throne and nothing less will content them. Hide not thyself from my supplication. Do not stop thine ear, or restrain thy hand. When a man saw his neighbor in distress, and deliberately passed him by, he was said to hide himself from him, and the psalmist begs that the Lord would not so treat him. In that dread hour when Jesus bore our sins upon the tree, the Father did hide himself. And this was the most dreadful part of all the son of David's agony. Well may each of us deprecate such a calamity as that God should refuse to hear our cries. Verse 2. Attend unto me and hear me. This is the third time he prays the same prayer. He is in earnest, in deep and bitter earnest. If his God do not hear, he feels that all is over with him. He begs for his God to be a listener and an answerer. I mourn in my complaint and make a noise. He gives a loose to his sorrows, permits his mind to rehearse her griefs, 
and then to pour them out in such language as suggests itself at the time, whether it be coherent or not. What a comfort that we may be thus familiar with our God. We may not complain of Him, but we may complain to Him. Our rambling thoughts, when we are distracted with grief, we may bring before Him, and that too in utterances rather to be called a noise than language. He will attend so carefully that He will understand us, and he will often fulfill desires which we ourselves could not have expressed in intelligible words. Groanings that cannot be uttered are often prayers which cannot be refused. Our Lord himself used strong cryings and tears, and was heard in that he feared. Verse 3. Because of the voice of the enemy. The enemy was vocal and voluble enough, and found a voice where his godly victim had nothing better than a noise, Slander is seldom short of expression. It prates and prattles evermore. Neither David nor our Lord nor any of the saints were allowed to escape the attacks of venomous tongues, and this evil was in every case the cause of acute anguish. Because of the oppression of the wicked. The unjust pressed and oppressed the righteous. Like an intolerable burden they crushed them down and brought them to their knees before the Lord. This is a thrice-told story, and to the end of time it will be true. He that is born after the flesh will persecute him that is born after the spirit. The great seed of the woman suffered from a bruised heel. For they cast iniquity upon me. They black me with their soot bags, throw the dust of their lying over me, cast the vitriol of their calumny over me. They endeavor to trip me up, and if I do not fall, they say I do and in wrath they hate me. With a hearty ill will they detest the holy man. It was no sleeping animosity, but a mortal rancor which reigned in their bosoms. The reader needs not that we show how applicable this is to our Lord. Verse 4. My heart is sore pained within me. His spirit writhed in agony like a poor worm. He was mentally as much in pain as a woman in travail physically. His inmost soul was touched and a wounded spirit who can bear. If this were written when David was attacked by his own favorite son, and ignominiously driven from his capital, he had reason enough for using these expressions. And the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Mortal fears seized him. He felt like one suddenly surrounded with the glooms of the shadow of death, upon whom the eternal night suddenly descends. Within and without he was afflicted, and his chief terror seemed to come from above, for he uses the expression, fallen upon me. He gives himself up for lost. He felt that he was as good as dead. The inmost center of his nature was moved with dismay. Think of our Lord in the garden, with his soul exceeding sorrowful even unto death, and you have a parallel to the griefs of the psalmist. Perchance, dear reader, if, as yet, thou hast not trodden this gloomy way, thou wilt do soon then be sure to mark the footprints of thy Lord in this miry part of the road. Verse 5. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me. Like housebreakers, these robbers were entering his soul. Like one who feels a fainting fit coming over him, so the oppressed suppliant was falling into a state of terror. His fear was so great as to make him tremble. He did not know what would happen next, or how soon the worst would come. The sly, mysterious whisperings of slander often cause a noble mind more fear than open antagonism. We can be brave against an open foe, but cowardly, plotting conspiracies bewilder and distract us. And horror hath overwhelmed me. He was as one enveloped in a darkness that might be felt. As Jonah went down into the sea, so did David appear to go down into the depths of horror. He was unmanned, confounded brought to a hideous state of suspense and mortal apprehension. Verse 6. And I said, O oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. If he could not resist as an eagle, he would escape as a dove. Swiftly and unobserved, on strong and untiring pinions, he would hie away from the abodes of slander and wickedness. His love of peace made him sigh for an escape from the scene of strife. O oh, for a lodge in some vast wilderness, some boundless contiguity of shade, where rumor of oppression and deceit might never reach me more. We are all too apt to utter this vain desire, for vain it is. No wings of doves or eagles could bear us away from the sorrows of a trembling heart. Inward grief knows nothing of peace. 
Moreover, it is cowardly to shun the battle when God would have us fight. We had better face the danger, for we had no armor for our backs. He had need of a swifter conveyance than dove's pinions, who would outfly slander. He may be at rest who does not fly, but commends his case to his God. Even the dove of old found no rest till she returned to her ark, and we amid all our sorrow may find rest in Jesus. We need not depart, all will be well if we trust in him. Verse 7. Lo, then would I wander far off. Yet when David was far off, he sighed to be once more near Jerusalem. Thus, in our ill estate, we ever think the past to be better than the present. We shall be called to fly far enough away, and perchance we shall be loath to go. We need not indulge vain notions of premature escape from earth. And remain in the wilderness. He found it none such a dear abode when there, yet resolves now to make it his permanent abode. Had he been condemned to receive his wish, he would ere long have felt like Selkirk in the poet's verse. O solitude, where are thy charms that sages have found in thy face? Better dwell in the midst of alarms than reign in this horrible place. Our Lord, while free from all idle wishes, found much strength in solitude, and loved the mountain's brow at midnight, and the quiet shade of the olives of Gethsemane. It is better practically to use retirement than pathetically to sigh for it. Yet it is natural, when all men do us wrong, to wish to separate ourselves from their society. Nature, however, must yield to grace, and we must endure the contradiction of sinners against ourselves, and not be weary and faint in our minds. Selah. After such a flight, well may the mind rest. When we are going too fast, and giving way too freely to regrets, it is well to cry, Halt, and pause a while, till more sober thoughts return. Verse 8. I would hasten my escape. He tried to pause, but could not, like a horse which, when pulled up, slips on a little, because of the speed at which he was going. David declares that he would not waste a moment, or stay to bid adieu to his friends, but up and away at once, for fear he should be too late, and because he could bear the clamor of his foes no longer. From the windy storm and tempest. A storm was brewing, and, like a dove, he would outfly it and reach a calmer region. Swifter than the storm cloud would he fly, to avoid the deluge of rain and the flash of the lightning. Alas, poor soul, no such wings are thine, as yet thou must tarry here and feel the tempest. But be of good cheer, thou shalt stretch thy wings ere long for a bolder flight. Heaven shall receive thee, and there thy sorrow shall have a finis of felicity among the birds of paradise. Verses 9 to 11. Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues, for I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go about it upon the walls thereof. Mischief also and sorrow are in the midst of it. Wickedness is in the midst thereof. Deceit and guile depart not from her streets. Verse 9. Destroy, O Lord. Put mine enemies to the rout. Let them be devoured by the sword, since they have unsheathed it against me. How could we expect the exiled monarch to offer any other prayer than this against the rebellious bands of Absalom and the crafty devices of Ahithophel? Divide their tongues. Make another babel in their debates and councils of war. Set them at cross-purposes. Divide the pack that the hunted one may escape. The divisions of error are the hope of truth. For I have seen violence and strife in the city. The rabble and their leaders were plotting and planning, raging and contending against their king, running wild with a thousand mad projects. Anarchy had fermented among them. And the king hoped that now it might come to pass that the very lawlessness which had exiled him would create weakness among his foes. Revolution devours its own children. They who are strong through violence will sooner or later find that their strength is their death. Absalom and Ahithophel may raise the mob, but they cannot so easily rule it, nor so readily settle their own policy as to remain firm friends. The prayer of David was heard. The rebels were soon divided in their councils. Ahithophel went his way to be hanged with a rope, and Absalom to be hanged without one. Verse 10 Day and night they go about it upon the walls thereof. The city, the holy city, had become a den of wickedness. 
conspirators met in the dark and talked in little knots in the streets even in broad daylight meanwhile the country was being roused to revolt and the traitors without threatened to environ the city and act in concert with the rebels within no doubt there was a smothered fire of insurrection which absalom kindled and fanned which david perceived with alarm some time before he left jerusalem and when he quitted the city it broke out into an open flame mischief also and sorrow are in the midst of it unhappy capital to be thus beset by foes left by her monarch and filled with all those elements of turbulence which breed evil and trouble unhappy king to be thus compelled to see the mischief which he could not avert laying waste the city which he loved so well there was another king whose many tears watered the rebellious city and who said o jerusalem jerusalem how often would i have gathered thy children together even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings and ye would not verse eleven wickedness is in the midst thereof the very heart of the city was base in her places of authority crime went hand in hand with calamity all the wilder and more wicked elements were uppermost the cannonail were commanders the scum floated uppermost justice was at a discount the population was utterly demoralized prosperity had vanished and order with it deceit and guile depart not from her streets in all the places of concourse crafty tongues were busy persuading the people with cozening phrases crafty demagogues led the people by the nose their good king was defamed in all ways and when they saw him go away they fell to reviling the governors of their own choosing the forum was the fortress of fraud the congress was the convention of cunning alas poor jerusalem to be thus the victim of sin and shame virtue reviled and vice regent her solemn assemblies broken up her priests fled her king banished and troops of reckless villains parading her streets sunning themselves on her walls and vomiting their blasphemies in her sacred shrines here was cause enough for the sorrow which so plaintively utters itself in these verses verses twelve to fourteen for it was not an enemy that reproached me then i could have borne it neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me then i would have hid myself from him but it was thou a man mine equal my guide and mine acquaintance we took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of god in company verse twelve the reader will do well to observe how accurately the psalmist described his own psalm when he said i mourn in my complaint or rather give loose to my thoughts for he proceeds from one point of his sorrow to another wandering on like one in a maze making few pauses and giving no distinct intimations that he is changing the subject now from the turbulent city his mind turns to the false-hearted consular for it was not an enemy that reproached me then i could have borne it it was not an open foe but a pretended friend he went over to the other camp and tried to prove the reality of his treachery by calumniating his old friend none are such real enemies as false friends reproaches from those who have been intimate with us and trusted by us cut us to the quick and they are usually so well acquainted with our peculiar weakness that they know how to touch us where we are most sensitive and to speak so as to do us most damage the slanders of an avowed antagonist are seldom so mean and dastardly as those of a traitor and the absence of the elements of ingratitude and treachery renders them less hard to bear we can bear from shemai what we cannot endure from ahithophel neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me then i would have hid myself from him we can find a hiding place from open foes but who can escape from treachery if our enemies proudly boast over us we nerve our souls for resistance but when those who pretend to love us leer at us with contempt whither shall we go our blessed lord had to endure at its worst the deceit and faithlessness of a favoured disciple let us not marvel when we are called to tread the road which is marked by his pierced feet verse thirteen but it was thou he sees him the poetic fury is on him 
he sees the traitor as though he stood before him in flesh and blood he singles him out he points his finger at him he challenges him to his face but thou a tu brute and thou ahithophel art thou here judas betrayest thou the son of man a man mine equal treated by me as one of my own rank never looked upon as an inferior but as a trusted friend my guide a counsellor so sage that i trusted thine advice and found it prudent to do so and mine acquaintance with whom i was on most intimate terms who knew me even as i knew him by mutual disclosures of heart no stranger occasionally conversed with but a near and dear friend admitted to my secret fellowship it was fiendish treason for such a one to prove false-hearted there was no excuse for such villainy judas stood very much in this relation to our lord he was treated as an equal trusted as a treasurer and in that capacity often consulted with he knew the place where the master was wont to spend his solitude in fact he knew all the master's movements and yet he betrayed him to his remorseless adversaries how justly might the lord have pointed at him and said but thou but his gentler spirit warned the son of perdition in the mildest manner and had not iscariot been tenfold a child of hell he would have relinquished his detestable purpose verse fourteen we took sweet counsel together it was not merely the counsel which men take together in public or upon common themes their fellowship had been tender and confidential the traitor had been treated lovingly and trusted much solace mutual and cheering had grown out of their intimate communings there were secrets between them of no common kind soul had been in converse with soul at least on david's part however feigned might have been the affection of the treacherous one the betrayed friend had not dealt with him coldly or guarded his utterance before him shame on the wretch who could belie such fellowship and betray such confidence and walked into the house of god in company religion had rendered their intercourse sacred they had mingled their worship and communed on heavenly themes if ever any bonds ought to be held inviolable religious connections should be there is a measure of impiety of a detestable sort in the deceit which debases the union of men who make professions of godliness shall the very altar of god be defiled with hypocrisy shall the gatherings of the temple be polluted by the presence of treachery all this was true of ahithophel and in a measure of judas his union with the lord was on the score of faith they were joined in the holiest of enterprises he had been sent on the most gracious of errands his cooperation with jesus to serve his own abominable ends stamped him as the firstborn of hell better had it been for him had he never been born let all deceitful professors be warned by his doom for like ahithophel he went to his own place by his own hand and retains a horrible preeminence in the calendar of notorious crime here was one source of heartbreak for the redeemer and it is shared in by his followers of the serpent's brood some vipers still remain who will sting the hand that cherished them and sell for silver those who raised them to the position which rendered it possible for them to be so abominably treacherous verse fifteen let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them verse fifteen not thus would jesus pray but the rough soldier david so poured out the anguish of his spirit under treachery and malice seldom equalled and altogether unprovoked the soldier as such desires the overthrow of his foes for this very end he fights and viewed as a matter of law and justice david was right in his wish he was waging a just and defensive war against men utterly regardless of truth and justice read the words as a warrior's imprecation let death seize upon them traitors such as these deserve to die there is no living with them earth is polluted by their tread if spies are shot much more these sneaking villains let them go down quick into hell while in the vigour of life into sheol let them sink let them suddenly exchange the enjoyment of the quick or living for the sepulchres of the dead there is however no need to read this verse as an imprecation it is rather a confident expectation or prophecy god would he was sure 
desolate them and cast them out of the land of the living into the regions of the dead for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them they are too bad to be spared for their houses are dens of infamy and their hearts fountains of mischief they are a pest to the commonwealth a moral plague a spiritual pestilence to be stamped out by the laws of men and the providence of god both ahithophel and judas soon ended their own lives absalom was hanged in the oak and the rebels perished in the wood in great numbers there is justice in the universe love itself demands it pity to rebels against god as such is no virtue we pray for them as creatures we abhor them as enemies of god we need in these days far more to guard against the disguised iniquity which sympathizes with evil and counts punishment to be cruelty than against the harshness of a former age we have steered so far from scylla that charybdis is absorbing us verses sixteen to nineteen as for me i will call upon god and the lord shall save me evening and morning and at noon will i pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice he hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me for there were many with me god shall hear and afflict them even he that abideth of old selah because they have no changes therefore they fear not god verse sixteen as for me i will call upon god the psalmist would not endeavour to meet the plots of his adversaries by counterplots nor imitate their incessant violence but in direct opposition to their godless behaviour would continually resort to his god thus jesus did and it has been the wisdom of all believers to do the same as this exemplifies the contrast of their character so it will foretell the contrast of their end the righteous shall ascend to their god the wicked shall sink to ruin and the lord shall save me jehovah will fulfil my desire and glorify himself in my deliverance the psalmist is quite sure he knows that he will pray and is equally clear that he will be heard the covenant name is the pledge of the covenant promise verse seventeen evening and morning and at noon will i pray often but none too often seasons of great need call for the frequent seasons of devotion the three periods chosen are most fitting to begin continue and end the day with god is supreme wisdom where time has naturally set up a boundary there let us set up an altar stone the psalmist means that he will always pray he will run a line of prayer right along the day and track the sun with his petitions day and night he saw his enemies busy verse ten and therefore he would meet their activity by continuous prayer and cry aloud he would give a tongue to his complaint he would be very earnest in his pleas with heaven some cry aloud who never say a word it is the bell of the heart that rings loudest in heaven some read it i will muse and murmur deep heart thoughts should be attended with inarticulate but vehement utterances of grief blessed be god moaning is translatable in heaven a father's heart reads a child's heart and he shall hear my voice he is confident that he will prevail he makes no question that he would be heard he speaks as if already he were answered when our window is opened toward heaven the windows of heaven are opened to us have but a pleading heart and god will have a plenteous hand verse eighteen he hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me the deliverance has come joab has routed the rebels the lord has justified the cause of his anointed faith sees as well as foresees in her foresight is sight he is not only safe but serene delivered in peace peace in his inmost soul for there were many with me many contending against me or it may be that he thankfully acknowledges that the lord raised him up unexpected allies fetched him succor when he most needed it and made the friendless monarch once more the head of a great army the lord can soon change our condition and he often does so when our prayers become fervent the crisis of life is usually the secret place of wrestling jabbok makes jacob a prevailing prince he who stripped us of all friends to make us see himself in their absence can give them back again in greater numbers that we may see him more joyfully in the fact of their presence verse nineteen god shall hear and afflict them 
They make a noise as well as I, and God will hear them. The voice of slander, malice, and pride is not alone heard by those whom it grieves. It reaches to heaven. It penetrates the divine ear. It demands vengeance and shall have it. God hears and delivers his people. He hears and destroys the wicked. Their cruel jests, their base falsehoods, their cowardly insults, their daring blasphemies are heard and shall be repaid to them by the eternal judge. Even he that abideth of old. He sits in eternity, enthroned judge for evermore. All the prayers of saints and profanities of sinners are before his judgment seat, and he will see that justice is done. Selah. The singer pauses, overwhelmed with awe in the presence of the everlasting God. Because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. His own reverential feeling causes him to remember the daring godlessness of the wicked. He feels that his trials have driven him to his God, and he declares that their uninterrupted prosperity was the cause of their living in such neglect of the Most High. It is a very manifest effect that long-continued ease and pleasure are sure to produce the worst influences upon graceless men. Though troubles do not convert them, yet the absence of them makes their corrupt nature the more readily develop itself. Stagnant water becomes putrid. Summer heat breeds noxious insects. He who is without trouble is often without God. It is a forcible proof of human depravity that man turns the mercy of God into nutriment for sin. The Lord save us from this. Verses 20 and 21. He hath put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. He hath broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn swords. Verse 20. The psalmist cannot forget the traitor's conduct, and returns again to consider it. He hath put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. He smites those to whom he had given the hand of friendship. He breaks the bonds of alliance. He is perfidious to those who dwell at ease because of his friendly professions. He hath broken his covenant. The most solemn league he has profaned. He is regardless of oaths and promises. Verse 21. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter. He lauded and larded the man he hoped to devour. He buttered him with flattery, and then battered him with malice. Beware of a man who has too much honey in his tongue. A trap is to be suspected where the bait is so tempting. Soft, smooth, oily words are most plentiful where truth and sincerity are most scarce. But war was in his heart. He brought forth butter in a lordly dish, but he had a tent-pin ready for the temples of his guest. When heart and lip so widely differ, the man is a monster, and those whom he assails are afflicted indeed. His words were softer than oil. Nothing could be more unctuous and fluent. There was no objectionable syllables, no jars or discords. His words were as yielding as the best juice of the olive. Yet were they drawn swords, rapiers unsheathed, weapons brandished for the fray. Ah, base wretch, to be cajoling your victim while intending to devour him and trapping him as if he were but a beast of prey, surely such art thou thyself. Verse 22. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Verse 22. Thy burden, or what thy God lays upon thee, lay it thou upon the Lord. His wisdom casts it on thee. It is thy wisdom to cast it on him. He casts thy lot for thee, cast thy lot on him. He gives thee thy portion of suffering, accept it with cheerful resignation, and then take it back to him by thine assured confidence. He shall sustain thee. Thy bread shall be given thee, thy water shall be sure. Abundant nourishment shall fit thee to bear all thy labors and trials. As thy days, so shall thy strength be. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. He may move like the boughs of a tree in the tempest, but he shall never be moved like a tree torn up by the roots. He stands firm who stands in God. Many would destroy the saints, but God has not suffered it and never will. Like pillars, the godly stand immovable to the glory of the great architect. Verse 23. 
but thou o god shalt bring them down into the pit of destruction bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days but i will trust in thee verse twenty three for the ungodly a sure terrible and fatal overthrow is appointed climb as they may the pit yawns for them god himself will cause them to descend into it and destruction there shall be their portion bloody and deceitful men with double iniquity of cruelty and craft upon them shall not live out half their days they shall be cut off in their quarrels or being disappointed in their artifices vexation shall end them they were in heart murderers of others and they became in reality self-murderers doubt not that virtue lengthens life and that vice tends to shorten it but i will trust in thee a very wise practical conclusion we can have no better ground of confidence the lord is all and more than all that faith can need as the foundation of peaceful dependence lord increase our faith evermore end of psalm fifty five